I'm going to sit. You get to sit. I don't know why I can't. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we're here not because we're good, but because we're yours. Take your word and your truth and put it in our minds so that we would not be superficial and silly Christians. And then, Father, drop it to our hearts so we wouldn't be cold Calvinists. And then put it in our hands and our feet and our vocal cords so the world can hear the laughter of the redeemed. As always, Father, we pray for the one who teaches. Forgive him his sins, because they are many. We would see Jesus and him only, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As you know, I love this church. I love, what do you want? Hmm? Can you hear me? Testing? We're good to go now, right? You're great. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> what was I? Oh, I love this church. I love coming to worship. I love the music. I love our pastor. I love our elders and officers and leaders and staff. But I have a confession to make. More often than not, when I come here to worship, I get irritated. <laughs> when I go to meetings at the church, I find myself being irritated. And it's not just because I'm old. If you're old, you're already irritated about that. It's something else, and I've been praying about it. I've been asking the Lord to show me, and I found out what it is. I don't have any control. I'm not the pastor, and I'm not an elder, and I don't even get a vote. A number of years ago, we were coming out of choir practice just at the same time. The session, our elders were coming out of an elders meeting. Evidently, it had been a horrible meeting, <laughs> and I started laughing. And one of the elders said, Brown, what are you laughing about? I said, because I just thought that I never again in my entire life will have to go to an elders meeting. <laughs> but I would put an addendum to that. When you're not an elder, you don't get a vote. We have ruling elders. If you're not the pastor, you don't have any leverage. You don't have any power, and frankly, that irritates me. Most of my friends my age, and I'm old as dirt, are either dead or retired, and the live ones often say to me, Steve, when are you going to retire? And I say, when I drool or die because you can't control anything when you're retired. My late mentor, Fred Smith, had a friend who was an executive of a large corporation, and he was retired, and he looked miserable, and Fred asked him what was wrong. And he said, Fred, when I was working, I had a list of, a, a row of buttons on my desk, and every time I pressed one of those buttons, something happened. Now I don't have one damn button. I get that. 
<laughs> I get that. The reason I don't like Christmas is you can't control Christmas. People are crazy. I don't like vacations because you can't control vacations. And I get irritated at church because I don't have a boat. You say, well, Steve, what would you change? I wouldn't change a thing. I love the music. I love our staff. I love the people. I love the me. I like everything about this church, but that's not the point. Here's the point. If I didn't, if there was something that I didn't like, I couldn't do a thing about it. You say, Steve, that's neurotic. <laughs> I know it is. But listen to me, it's also a sin. And it's a bigger sin than most of us think. As I've been studying this week, I've realized that almost all of our shame, all of our insecurities, all of our guilt, all of our fear, all of our anxieties come from a need to control. There are some texts that are bigger than the words of the text. In other words, a particular text will address an issue, but as you read it, all kinds of things come to your mind, and you realize that you're being given principles that apply in a whole lot of areas. Our text for this morning does that. It's a part of the Sermon on the Mount, and it's from the sixth chapter of Matthew, where Matthew says, beginning at the 25th verse, that Jesus said this, Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat and what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on, is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you of much more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his statue? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all of his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for, for your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Now, in just a minute, we're going to talk about control, but, but first, I want to go down a clarifying side road to make sure that you don't take what I'm going to teach you this morning wrong. One of the interesting things about Scripture is the passive, aggressive teaching of Scripture. Some places, when you read the scripture, you realize that God is in the charge of everything, Romans 8, 28. And all you have to do is to accept the gifts and be still and know. And in other places, 
whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your mind. This one thing I do, it goes on and on, and it seems like a mix. Let me tell you what Spurgeon said. He said we ought to pray as if God controlled everything, and we ought to work as if we controlled everything. In other words, if your house is on fire, pray about it, but get a hose. If somebody breaks into your house, pray they get saved. But don't forget your gun. When your pagans uh, don't know Christ, pray that they come to Christ. But you go and you tell them. I was in commercial broadcasting for a very long time. And one of the great no-nos about commercial broadcasting is the danger of dead air. I can't tell you how often when we didn't have anything to say or the air went dead, somebody, generally the manager or the program director, would say, don't stand there. Do something, say something, create something. I don't have any news. I just shot the news director. <laughs> now we do, and the Bible does the same thing. In the background is God sovereign over every molecule of our lives. The good and the bad, the laughter and the tears the pain and the joy, every bit of it. But when you have something to do, do it as best you can, and that's enough. All right, let's talk about control. This morning I'm going to teach you how to play poker and make some money, especially if you're a pagan. And if you're Christian, I'm going to teach you something that will absolutely change your life. If you're old enough, you remember the old campus crusade for Christ. It's called Crew. And in the olden days, and they still have a version of it, there was a little yellow booklet called The Four Spiritual Laws. And God used that in an amazing way all over the world. But in that little booklet, if you remember, there was always a question, who sits on the throne of your life? In fact, in some of those little booklets, there was a little chair to represent a throne. And you would ask and point to the chair and say, that's your throne. Who's sitting on the throne of your life? That's a good question. Who is sitting on the throne of your life. And everything you just thought is wrong. It's not what you think. Some of you are saying, oh, spit. I got to be a preacher. I got to go to church more. I got to be a lot nicer. I got to smile all the time. God's probably going to send me to some third world country without internet because God's on the... No, it's not. That has nothing to do with God being in control. I have a friend. His name is Tal Prince. He's the late Cliff Barrow's stepson. And I've loved Tal like a son for more years than I say. He told me last week. I asked him if he made any New Year's resolutions, and he said, no, I don't do that anymore. I said, you don't make any? And he said, no, I don't do any. He said, uh, the reason is that I have demonstrated before God and everybody I know that I'm incapable of fulfilling New Year's resolutions. And then he said, but let me tell you what I've done. I now make New Year's relinquishments. When he said it, the light went on, and I thought, you know, I can do that. When I can't do it, I relinquish it. When it hurts, I relinquish it. 
When I see what I'm supposed to be, I relinquish it. When I want to love more, I relinquish it. I don't make promises, I break those. And then when I break them, I have to lie, and that makes things worse than they are. So I make relinquishments, and that's what it means to have God sitting on the throne of your life. There's a statement in Scripture, and you've quoted it before, but you didn't know where it came from. It's the 46th Psalm and the 10th verse. And this is what it says. Be still and know that I am God. The Hebrew word for be still is rafa, and it means drop the microphone. It means literally to let it go. That's what it means to have. It doesn't mean you're smart or faithful or good or pure and you'll be better than everybody else because God is sitting on your throne. It's because you know you're not. And you relinquish that fact to a God who loves you more than you could know. And by the way, that's the way you play poker too. And I'm going to show you. If, if we relinquish, turn control over in a poker game or in life, we can risk. Jesus says, your father knows. Don't get so uptight that you need all of those things. And then he calls us to the biggest risk of our life. Seek first. The kingdom of God. I don't do very good with that. But seek first the kingdom of God and all this stuff that will be yours as well. If you know that, you can risk. Don't play poker if you can't afford to lose. And don't play poker and be conservative all the time or you'll lose everything you've got. And don't live life that way either. The good news that we as Christians have <laughs> is the gifts that God gives us. And you know one of the best gifts he gives us? The gift of not giving a rip. The gift of recognizing that he's got my back. And when the doctor tells me I've got cancer, when my kids aren't following, when I'm going through issues of abuse in my life, when I'm broke and I've lost my job and I can't pay the mortgage payment, at that point, you don't have a thing to lose. He's got your back, and it's all his. After Hurricane Andrew, we'd lost our house. I almost became a Christian when the roof came off. I mean, it was awful. People asked me what spiritual lessons I learned. The most important was tie the tresses down. <laughs> it was an awful time. I had an old car and a tree hit it. It was an old Buick. And we were in a little apartment where the one window looked out on a brick wall. It was awful. And I went out to go to church and my car was gone. Somebody stole that ugly car. I went back in and I said, Hannah, somebody stole God's car. And she started laughing. And I started laughing. And we giggled like little girls. And you know why? Because it wasn't our car. It's all his when you relinquish it. I have a friend. I've only met her once. She's in another state. She's the freest Christian I know. Uh, she's delightful. She's a wonderful photographer, an artist, an amazing lady. And they told her she had cancer. And she emailed me, and uh, one of the staff members passed it on to me. And I and a lot of others, I asked, have been praying for. 
a couple of days ago, in an email, she wrote to me. Let me read what she said. She said, I haven't been immortal since the whole 2017 Christmas diagnosis. I don't think I can ever go back there and go through denial again. It was such a comfortable place to live. I didn't willingly take the red pill, you know. It was forced down my throat with kicking and screaming. Now, though I could live, and she's in remission, until I'm 100, I live each day with the awareness that this could be my last one. And I am so free. So, looking at what Jesus said in the text I read to you, go get a milkshake. <laughs> go offend somebody. Go risk. Speak in tongues. Giggle at inappropriate times and dance as if nobody was looking because you're free to risk. And that's what it means to have God on the throne of your life. But there's more. If you relinquish it all, and God is on the throne of your life, in poker and in life, you can walk. Jesus said, let the day's own trouble be sufficient for the day. Let me tell you something. There are some problems you can't fix. There are some problems that have no solution. There are some problems you can't redeem and make better. It just is. My late mentor, Fred Smith, said that the difference in maturity and immaturity is to know the difference between facts and problems. A problem is something that you can do something about. A fact is something you just have to accept. That great theological mind of our time and metaphysicist Kenny Rogers said it well. <laughs> you got to know when to hold them. You got to know when to fold them. And you got to know when to walk away. I have a new doctor, and I love him. He's just great, Robert uh, Schamberger. Uh, he was giving me an initial physical exam, and he did what every doctor does when they're examining. He said, uh, Steve, you smoke? I said, yeah, I smoke a pipe. And before he could say anything, I said, hey, you drink? And he said, well, on occasion. And I said, let's make a deal. You leave me alone about my pipe, and I'll leave you alone about your booze. <laughs> and he started laughing. And then he said, God bless him. That works for me. <laughs> There's some things you can't fix. When you can't fix, just leave it alone. You're free to walk away. You got a friend you can't lead to Christ, walk away. You got a kid that won't do everything that you want, and they're going in the other direction, walk away. You got financial problems, you got cancer. If you can't fix it, it's not yours. Then I have one other thing. We'll go get lunch. If God's on the throne of your life, uh, if you've given up control and relinquished it to him, you are free to trust, or in a poker game, to trust that the dealer isn't going to cheat you. That's what Jesus is saying in this text. He said, your father knows. 
about your needs. And he loves you a lot more than the birds and a lot more than the lilies of the field. Lean back on him and lean on him hard. Now, I'm going to give you two principles that will change your life if you listen. The first is this. Whatever you think God is doing in your life right now, he probably isn't. His ways are circuitous. And he doesn't ask for our vote, and he does things that are so crazy. So whatever, and don't be that arrogant thing God told me from his mouth to my ear. I know what, no, you don't. Whatever you think he's doing in your life right now, he probably isn't. And the second principle is this. Trust and relinquishment are hardly ever chosen. They are generally forced. Trust and relinquishment are hardly ever chosen. They're almost forced. I can't tell you the number of things that God has ripped out of my hand and I didn't like. It's, it's what you're going through right now. It's the questions you have, the pain you feel, the secret you can't hide, the sleepless nights. All of that is because God loves you so much that he wants you to say, what the hey, and just give it to him. We've always had German shepherds. We've had five or six. In the early service, I asked Mark and Sabrina, they love shepherds too. If they had one, they said they didn't. And both of us, all three of us, and Anna too sitting here, we all have sad looks on our faces. The memories of the shepherds that we've had. Quincy, the wonder dog. He had dysplasia. He had some problems in his hip. And our vet, instead of putting him down, said, Steve, I think I can cut some cartilage out of that. And he'll limp a little bit, but he'll live a full life. And I said, do it. And he said, well, it's a very major painful operation. But let's try it and see. So I took Quincy, trusting Quincy, to the vet, left him off, and he was there for three days. When I went back to pick him up, he was bandaged and in great pain, and I literally had to carry him to the car with him whining and crying the whole time, and I put him in the back seat, headed for home. When we got home, uh, we had a blanket spread out in the family room, and I placed him very gently uh, on the blanket, and he was whining and crying and in horrible pain. And I sat down in my chair and started reading the paper, and I thought to myself, I've lost my dog. He'll never follow me again. He'll, he'll never trust me again. And just at that moment, I felt the bottom of the paper shake. And Quincy stuck his head under the paper and laid his head on my lap. Oh, my. It was awful. He was forced to trust. And he did. And he lived another 10 years, chased every ball we ever threw. So, when God's on the throne of your life, you're free. Risk. You can walk when you need to. You got facts and not problems. And you learn through circumstances that God is faithful and he's good and he's faithful and he's good all the time. Years ago, when Anna and I were dating, <laughs> that's been longer than some of you have been alive. We were in college together, and I didn't have any money. 
I mean Zippo. I was running a laundry and getting three cents for every shirt and pouring that back into my education. I didn't have money to take Anna to a dinner or a movie or even buy her a donut. And so our dates in those days generally consisted of walking around the campus and just talking. And sometimes I would say to Anna, I hate this. I wish I had some money so we could go to a nice place for dinner or to a movie or a play or something. And she said to me then, and she said to me subsequently exactly the same thing a great number of times. You know what she said? She laughed and said, Steve, I don't care where we go as long as as I'm with you. What's God doing in your life? He's bringing you to that point. Trust him. So you can say, God, I don't like this. And I don't. I told him this morning he could heal my hearing if he really loved me. I hate these hearing aids. and they, I just wear them for show anyway. But in that, in every doubt and every bit of pain, and every dark place I walk, he's teaching me. I don't care where I go or what happens as long as I'm with you. Okay, if you listened to what I taught you, it'll help. And if you're a better poker player, Give me 10% of your winnings. <laughs> you think about that. Amen.